a little bit more uh, into air. This is very thin. This is a little thicker. This one into water. And water is what changes. And of course, earth, okay, is what's stable. So this is what I see going on. I see this process. Kind of like this. Okay. And uh, 2011, I was invited to go to this era where this building was built. I was invited to go there. And I was invited there to go and, ex and uh, exhibit my art. And uh, it was a celebration of Bruno Steiner's 100th anniversary of the impulse for a building. An impulse for a building. No building, but an impulse. So when I was invited to go there, I had three months before I went. So I decided that if I was invited to this place, why don't I design a building? And it would be a way of honoring him and his building and what he did and so forth. And so I did. I spent three months building a model and designing it and so forth to take it. And I did. I took it there. And I gave a lecture at the Gartheon. Uh, an hour and a half lecture on this building. Okay, but at the same time, I also, they had an exhibition that was based on a cube. They had this big cube, huge cube, all lit like it is, in that little door. And what was, uh, what they did is they invited artists to put one piece of work inside. Only one, for a week. And they did that for 12 artists. So when my turn came up, of course, you know, I mean, of course, I, this is what I submitted. Okay, and the reason I submitted that is because that is a form, okay, that is, that is not visible in this part of the world. It's not a physical form. Okay, and I'll explain why that's not a physical form. That is a form, okay, that comes out of the invisible. So, what I did was, um, for the last 12 years, uh, 13 years, I have been doing everything I can possibly do to ground that form. I have over 100 YouTubes that talk about that form. You can go to them, they're right there. You can go on the internet under, under the web or images and you'll see hundreds of pictures of that form. It's now in a book, that form. Uh, it is all over the place being made in paper forms. Plus I sell bronze chestahedrons. And I don't sell many, but they're on. That's a bronze one. So. The Gertianum, after the exhibit and the cube, they bought that. Now that's in their museum. That's in Rudolf Steiner's archives. All right. That form is grounded. I don't have to worry about it anymore. There's not any mathematician come around and mess around with me. There's not any artist that can come in and say that's not right. Or, or any uh, physicist. I've already covered it all. It's grounded. There's nothing anybody can do about it. And that's good. <laughs> so I did my job, okay? I, did, I brought something in and I grounded it. All right, so uh, I thought, well, what is the best way to try to design a building based on that form that would relate to the first Gertian? This is the first one. This is the one that, I, that, that inspired me. This one does, this one inspired me. But it's gone. So what is there I could do that would bring in something that would relate, okay, to that building? So I'm going to show you things about that form right there that you can't see. And there it is right there. There it is in edges only. That big form right there. But remember that there are things in here that you can't see. But there's all kinds of stuff going on in here. And I'm going to show you what they are. So I'm going to show you how you bring things invisible. So, let me talk uh, just five minutes about an invention that had to do with perception. And that's what this is, is all about, perceiving what is unseen. And so one of the biggest inventions that came in that really affected everything was the camera. And the camera came in about 150 years ago, 
And uh, what it did, I'm going to do it real briefly, what the camera did is it changed the arts, as far as I'm concerned. Modern arts changed because of it. Okay, so the camera allowed the human being to see the invisible. Now what it did, it was used in a microscope. Now the microscope was seeing things that were so small we couldn't see. But the camera could pick that up and then now we could see it. And that went on smaller and smaller and smaller we could see the, the bug on the hair fly, on the fly of a flea. And that little bug, okay, had wings. Well, we got to see that. Now it's all the way down and we can see nano. We can see one millionth smaller than an inch with the camera. We can focus on something that we can't even see and then we can see what we couldn't see. Now exactly the same thing with the telescope. Okay, the telescope goes, I don't know, use the Hubble telescope, which is everybody's familiar with what it sees. It's unbelievable what it sees. But when it focuses out, they call it deep space. And that deep space, they're focusing on nothing. This is black. And then what happens? And they take a picture of them. Oh my gosh, these aren't stars, these are galaxies. And there's so many of them, it's unbelievable. Which you all seen. Okay, that is also the camera is seeing the unseen. And all of a sudden had x-rays. We were able to start to see through our flesh and see bones. And that was really scary to a lot of people because that was close to the seeing death. And then some people try to take the camera and do double images and do uh, kind of things that make it look like there was a spirit or a ghost. Okay, and also that was done. Uh, and then people started to take the plate that received the light images and put their hands on it, and then there was an energy that was coming out of the fingers as it was done in Russia. Okay, and now they have cameras that you don't even have to put your fingers on, you can picture, and then there's an aurora around it. And if you do a certain thing with water or whatever, it changes, right, Kevin? These things, okay, are seeing the unseen. And now we have cat stands, okay? And we have uh, images that are created by magnets, okay? So here we go. So what I'm telling you about that is that the camera was made by the human being to see the unseen in the physical world. The camera cannot photograph what is unseen on the other side that's not physical. There are two sides. There's a physical side and there's a non-physical side. And the non-physical side cannot be taken a picture of. It. Because that's not matter. Now this is a whole new field that's opened up, okay? And I think in the year 2000. That's when I discovered this form. And I discovered it because of a tetrahedron. Now a tetrahedron is the first form that comes in to the world, three-dimensionally. And its angles are at 70.5 three degrees. So, throughout history, this has been around, and everybody's compressed it. Compress it, compress it, compress it, make it smaller and smaller and smaller, and more dense, more dense, more dense. And that is all we have as far as the platonic forms and all the other forms that are around. <coughs> They're all compressed. Okay. So I'm going to explain kind of what I did. If you take a point, this is a point, and this is a line, which is a point that keeps moving out to a line. Now, this is the first dimension, a line. The second dimension, okay, is a plane. So what I have found out was, is that I found a new process called fanning. I called it fanning because if I take a line and I divide it in half, I can make two-dimensional world. And that's a triangle. That's the first two-dimensional form that comes into our existence, a triangle. And what's amazing about that is if I close this triangle, this flat piece that goes across here doesn't go back in a straight line. It goes back at an 
at a, at a, see how it's going like this now? And then if I go down a little bit more, look how steep that is. Look, you see how steep that is? So not in any of the books. If I put it down all the way, it's really steep and it's back to a line. So the first three-dimensional form, this is two-dimensional, the first three-dimensional form is made up of four of those guys, four triangles. Nothing can come into the third dimension before this, period. Okay, so what I say, everybody can pack, can pack, can pack, can pack, condense, condense, but I didn't do that. I took my same thing here, fanning, and I fanned this out. I opened it up, and I fanned it out. I opened up the, the tetrahedron like this, and what I found inside was nothing. Nothing in there. But after I studied, I realized that there was something in there. And so I have spent a lot of years to try to find out what is, what is in there. What is in there that is logical? What is in there that uh, is true? What is in there that's not fantasy? What is in there that's lawful? Okay, so what I did is I opened this up until it got to 94.8 degrees and then this surface right here became equal in area to these. And this is what it looks like. And that's just a heater. Because when you fan out, no one's ever done this, when you fan out a form like this, the lines increase upward. This is so amazing. There's what happens is you form a kite. It doesn't have a fan with the lines going this way, like the kite I showed you, or the fan I showed you, but now this form starts to expand at the top and go up into a kite shape. So as soon as you open this form up, it becomes seven-sided. And if you'd open it up to the certain degree I told you, there are equal surfaces, half of them. So you can see that as, as you open up this more and more, you will see that the kite gets bigger. Instead of going down two-dimensionally, three-dimensionally, it goes up. Of course, then it goes up. Now, when this process goes on, past those degrees, I have found a way to find out what all that goes on here. What's happening now? What is this form? I've found new forms, and these forms, I want to tell you, this is known as a stellation up here. That has a form in there that's been stellated out from its surfaces. And that's all that anybody and any geometrist has ever known. Now, I have found that a stellation creates a form. The stellation doesn't need a form to stellate. The stellation comes in before the form. And there's a whole new form. And then it goes on and on. And there's a place where it crosses over, and then there's next to nothing. It's less than a vacuum. It's less than a vacuum. I call it more than something. <laughs> OK, so based on this tetrahedron, I designed a building. So I wanted to try to find out what was going on here that was unseen. OK, so if you take the tetrahedron and you find out the center of its face and the center of this face, they have two different faces. All platonic forms have one same face. All the faces are the same. Not on this. This is a form that's gone across the threshold. This is on the other side. Because this isn't in the physical world. This isn't physical. And I popped the chest of heat out of there. This is in the non-physical world. An unlawful way. If I pop it out and I found out exactly the center, there's two triangles. There's two triangles in the center of the kites and in the center of the triangles. Now, those two triangles, you can't see if they're there. If I spin those two triangles, the blue one and the yellow one at the same time, they look like this. The triangles become circles when you start to spin them. OK, so in this case, they're flattened out. 
but they're the same, okay, if you bring them up. So the, the tetrahedron relates to this building and the cupolas, but this time the cupolas are on top of each other. They're not laying down flat, they're standing up. And they're exactly the same size as this one because Russ Steiner based his geometry on five and seven. So the big one is seven, and the little one is five. So when you put them together, you put the stars and so forth. This is five, this is seven. He measured the geometrists, the two architects measured this five and seven, because that's what he wanted. All right, so I found out that if I spin those two circles like that, and I flatten them out like he did, that's this drawing. This is the bigger one, and this is the smaller one. But what I did is I put a five-pointed star, just like he did. I put a five-pointed star, and then I extended these lines up here. This is called projective geometry. Okay, projective geometry is that you have a threshold right here, which happens to be a curve. And if you take this line straight up like that, it hit this circle. And if I took this line up, it hit that circle. And in between here and here, divides this circle into seven. Perfect. There's never been a geometry that brought five and seven together. I didn't do that. You saw how I did it. So, Ruth Steiner's drawing is seven and five across. It's called a diameter. But this form is five and seven on the circumference, on the periphery. So there's a relationship here now with the first Girthiana and this form. So here, uh, as another view of another drawing I did of the same thing. And it shows that there are 12 stars. This form has 12 edges. And it has the 5 and the 7. So the star that's in the center is moving around. And why that star is that configuration? Because that's not paint. That's a print, but that's not paint. That's metal. That's gold. And that no pigment can, can get that kind of effect, okay, on a on a, a display like this. Okay, so what I did next was is I took Ruta Steiner's drawing. So I got a big one, and I have this one. This is the original one. Same, same drawing. I just photographed it. This is Ruta Steiner's drawing, and all of this is mine. And what I found out was that if I all these drawings, all these lines are his, not me. All I did was take a colored pencil and color in the, the, the edges. And I found out that from the center of the first large cupola to the periphery, there's a kite. Look at that pink kite. I thought, oh my gosh, is that kite, you know, you know what I mean. So then I saw, that also there's a triangle which I made green. And that triangle fits on the side of the kite and that falls into a chest of hedron. Absolutely. That's another relationship that the first Gertheonum has to this. So what I did is I, I found out that there's a big kite that goes all the way across the whole circle. Another kite. And from here to here is the triangle that fits that kite. Another indication that there's something that's similar. So here it is. So five and a seven and the five and a seven. So this is a close-up that shows what I talked about. You can see. Now, I also wanted to do what he did, was that I wanted to find out if the bigger circle and the little circle, and this circle here, what was this geometry that it was connected to? And I found out this. That the outside circle is seven, the inside circle is six, and the bigger one is five. That's five, six, seven. This is an unbelievable job you've never seen. 